Hi, everyone. Welcome back to our podcast from the Kama Sutra to 2020, where we look at your questions, your concerns, even your worries around all things to do with sex and sexuality. And today we are absolutely delighted to have with us Zubair Kalsia. Zubair is not just a really good friend, but he is an incredible voice in the area of queer, queer rights in India. Uh, he's the one who manages the PR and culture for Diageo India for their luxury area. And today Zubair is with us because along with many other things, he is also HIV positive. Zubair was diagnosed about three years ago and has spent the last three years collating, collecting, finding, researching information on HIV to see how he can help everybody else out there in the most normal, basic vocabulary that actually uh, we can put out to everybody and that makes sense to people when they listen to it. So, as you know, we did a reel a while ago and lots of questions came in. So um, this is oh, the I'm whole super podcast. I'm happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And thanks. I mean, I'm so glad that we're doing this. And yeah, we, we did have our reel, which, you know, a lot of people looked at it. A lot of people commented and... You know, I feel like this was much needed for us to do this because there were some comments here and there that, you know, there were worries, there were also other random things. So I think it's good that we're all sitting down having this chat and addressing a lot of it. Yeah, I'm super excited because I just think, you know, when there was so much conversation in the 90s and the early 2000s around HIV AIDS, and now we don't hear, but I feel like the myths from that time continue. And I remember working for NAS London and being really surprised that now HIV is seen as a chronic condition uh, and very rarely in, you know, does it convert to AIDS. So maybe let's just start with giving our audiences the first basic information around what is HIV and how is it different from AIDS? So actually that's a great place to start because a lot of people don't actually know the difference between the two and they kind of use them interchangeably. HIV is the virus and it is human, human immunodeficiency virus. And that's the virus that enters your system, but that's the virus that can be treated. If not treated, it leads to a condition or a syndrome called AIDS, which is when the immune system of your body has been attacked by this virus and the level of the virus is so much that your immune system is heavily compromised and you reach a state where you start to get affected with a lot of other um, illnesses and you catch a lot of other viruses and things like that. So you, it basically attacks your immunity. But the difference is that when someone has HIV, they not necessarily will have AIDS. HIV is at a stage where the virus is in your system, but if you're taking medication, it will not lead to AIDS. And actually, thankfully, today we're at a stage where it doesn't lead to AIDS as long as you're on medication and you're taking your ART. And tell us about the ART. Is it this scary medicine? Like, you know, people think it might be like this really scary treatment, like, you know, cancer, chemotherapy, like visuals come up. Or do you think it is just a pill that you have to take? And it's quite... So honestly, scary. it is just a pill a day. Um, and it's not to sort of trivialize the importance of that pill, but it is a pill a day. And what that pill does is that it basically controls the level of the virus in your body. So the virus does not keep spreading in your, in your blood system, in your bloodstream, in your body, so that it does not lead to AIDS. And what that also does actually very interestingly is that it, it, if you keep taking your pills after roughly about six months, depending on your body and how you're responding to medication, you actually reach this stage of, stage of being U equals to you, which is undetectable, is untransmittable. And that's a very interesting interesting topic, but the medication is, is a pill a day, sometimes two, depending on how your body reacts, everybody's body is different, but it is a pill. It will take some time getting used to taking a pill a day, but it just adds to your life and you can live a really enriched life uh, after taking that pill. So let me ask this question then, then because it's a chronic illness that you're managing, how does it impact the lifestyle? Like you are in a very public uh, profile job, uh, you're talking about HIV. So has the lifestyle changed? Obviously we remember the horror stories where, 
you know, people would lose yes. their jobs, their relationships and everything because of this. So how how is it different now and what does it look like now? All of those things that you want to do in your life, and if you put it down on a piece of paper and you, you still look at it after, or I look at it after the diagnosis, I still can do all of those things. Um, and therefore, I think it does not impact your lifestyle directly. What I will say is that because, you know, there's so many different opinions and misconceptions and stigma and all of that around it, when you have to survive in different ecosystems, you deal with a lot of different people. So therefore, I think not for nothing, it actually makes you stronger and gives you tougher skin. And it allows you to actually reach harder for the things you want to do. I'm still doing all the things I want to do. I travel I, um, you know, I go out and have a drink with friends when I'm a singer, I perform at club, pubs, and I have a very, very um, enriching career um, in the alcohol industry. So there's, there's all of these things that you can still do and nothing changes. And it's just about how you can equip yourself to deal with those different people and ecosystems. And that's why conversations like this are so important because it lets you sort of take back and say, okay, I know that Everyone is not 100% aware of HIV, but I am secure enough in who I am. And therefore, I still want all those things that I wanted pre-diagnosis. Um, one of the things we were trying to put across last time was that two things simultaneously, which was really hard, actually. Uh, one, to say that do not take HIV lightly. You need to take all the precautions that are imaginable to make sure that you do not contract this virus. But if it happens through almost any number of reasons that you do get it, then life doesn't come to an end. Every opportunity is still available to you. I think the biggest problem that we found, Amrita, Zubair and I did a reel on this some time ago. And it isn't the fact that we can't put the information out. The problem was people don't want to listen. We are back again here trying to see if we can give more weight to the same conversation. And what yes. I really want to start with, Zubair and I mentioned something, and we're going to today, for everybody listening out there, ask Dr. Anvita Madan Behel to respond to this particular question. One of the things that we said was, um, I said, can HIV spread through kissing? And Zubair said, under very specific circumstances, but basically speaking, it is not through saliva that HIV spreads. And of course, there was any amount of um, argument on that. Will you, Anvita, weigh in on this one for us, please? Yeah, and I, and I feel like it feels like an old school record to go around and saying this is the way HIV spreads because I think science and medicine has gone so beyond, uh, you know, when we come to HIV AIDS. So it does not spread from kissing. Um, you cannot get HIV. And it's really important to say HIV and not AIDS. You know, that's what Zubair was saying. You cannot, it's the virus that gets transmitted. So you cannot get HIV from kissing anybody. It is a sexually transmitted, in, you know, infection, which you will get if you have unprotected sex. But what I would actually like to add to it is, as Zubair was saying, and it's now this complicated medical world where even if you have unprotected sex, it depends on the levels of the virus in the carrier and they, by mistake, it happens and you are at risk of contracting um, the virus they now even have precautionary, um, you know, medication like you know the like you have um, the eye pill, the next day pregnancy pill. You have the next day prevention of HIV. Obviously, we don't want you. It's not a, let's go and do all risk behavior and then go and have that pill. But you know, things happen, uh, and uh, science has advanced to that point. Medicine has that if you feel that it was a difficult night, things happened, and you want to go and prevent it. There's even medication around it. Um, so kissing, definitely not. Uh, and even so only way you get it sexually is unprotected penetrative sex. 
um, you know, and those are the only, it could be anal or vaginal, but those are the ways you get it. So I'm just going to quickly jump in with one question, uh, you know, because this came up a lot, that yeah. even if it's uh, you're kissing and saliva won't spread it, but if you have lesions in the mouth, if you have wounds or cuts in the mouth, will, so, and then you kiss the person, will that spread it? It actually will not, because the the science behind it is that, and maybe, you know, doctor, you want to weigh in as well, because I think it would be good to, you know, hear both of our inputs on it. One is someone who spent time reading about this and researching, but also yourself, who, you know, is probably a little more qualified than I am to talk about it as well. But the, the the science behind it or the medical science behind it is that the virus actually doesn't live in saliva because the saliva creates and automatically contains an enzyme that actually kills the virus as such or makes it dormant. So the chances of that happening are extremely, extremely, extremely rare. When I say extremely rare, there are like 0.0001% chance that that would happen. And there are studies that have been done by the Center for Disease Control. There have been studies by, been by, done by so many uh, medical hospitals, by Mayo Clinic, et cetera, um, and that show that there are no actual documented cases of this happening. But however, because of the perception or the perceived risk, which is not an actual risk, but the perceived risk, you have a lot of people still believing in the fact that yes, it could happen. And also, fact is that you would need about almost like 15 liters of saliva for this to actually um, actually spread and even then it's really really rare. I don't have much to add you covered it all you know and I and I just think that I really feel where it comes from is that we had all those it was um, you know, just the way if we think about COVID, it was an unknown illness, which had so many myths around it, and people were so scared about it. And we had so many deaths from it, um, that it, it was frightful. But it's now, you know, it's been 30 years since the peak of the whole illness and when it was uh, very serious and uh, problematic. And medical science has really progressed. Um, and so it's actually now time to put these myths to rest and stop being so scared, so stop being so punitive about it any longer. You know, it's a very different age and era of it. And people, I feel, are still living with those perceptions from 30 years ago. Yeah. You know, it's interesting, Anvita. I, I, I did not know that you have a morning after pill for HIV. Yeah, it's actually called uh, post-exposure prophylaxis, which basically um, is it actually has the similar compounds as ART, which you take regularly if you are diagnosed with HIV. But what the pill does is that if you feel that you, even through any circumstance, have been exposed to the virus or could have been exposed to the virus through unprotected intercourse, penetration, or any other way that usually it spreads, um, you can take PEP, which is post-exposure prophylaxis, and that reduces the chances of you contracting the virus after, after known exposure, and you have to take it within um, between 24 to 48 hours max, not beyond that, but it basically reduces the chances of you getting or contracting the virus to almost 0%, not really, but it really reduces the chances So that. And it's a similar to case with a lot of uh, post-exposure uh, medication out there, but it reduces the chances to a very, very abysmal level. Yeah, and what I would add to that is that each time you have unprotected sex, it doesn't mean you jump. You know, we know people yeah. um, who might be at parties or might be aware of situations or you know we know of a lot of chem sex parties that happen um, and then you don't know the partners that you've slept with and um, you don't know if there's um, unprotected sex that might have taken place um, so there are you know reasons behind people taking it uh, and there is a whole medical procedure it's you know you need to be aware of 
It has to be taken within a certain time frame. You can't take it later. And what's really interesting is that you won't go for an HIV test because the HIV will not show up, uh, but it is more um, behavioral reaction. Like you might be aware that you might be at risk and that's yeah. when you take it. It's not something that you can go for a blood test and it comes out and then you take it. It's based on things that might have happened um, you know, the day before or otherwise. Um, and within the community, I think education around what those things are really important and they like, take place um, so that you're more aware that if these actions or behaviors happen that were at risk, then you should go, as in here, you go to a gum clinic to get it. Uh, but, you know, in India, you go, I'm guessing, to a doctor or I don't know if you it's off the shelf in pharmacy. Yeah. But here you go to a gum. Well, you would go to the doctor as well here. Um, and then you would basically get a prescription for it. It's not really over the counter here. However, um, you know, there are certain uh, manufacturers that you can contact and whatever. But I think the the access to PrEP and PEP is still not as um as great as what it should be in, in India right now, which is why, you know, it's even harder to procure and therefore certain doctors will prescribe it, certain doctors won't prescribe it. And then you have to go to certain pharmacies only that will actually have it. So the access in that channel is not the best right now. Um, but just the other thing I actually, you know, when you were, you were talking, I actually wanted to talk about PrEP as well, because PEP we know is post exposure, but PrEP is pre exposure. And for whatever reason, if you and your partner or the other consenting person that you're having intercourse with do decide, um, consensually decide to have unprotected sex and are sexually active, there is also a pre-exposure pill, which is pre-exposure prophylaxis that they can take, which again reduces the chances of um, contracting HIV to a very, very, very abysmal level. But again, like you said, even with that pill, it's not like just popping a candy and, you know, you know, going ahead with, with indulging in intercourse. But it actually requires you to take it a certain time before for it to actually take effect and to be in its most effective, you know, place in your body to actually protect you. So it's not like you take it in the morning and, you know, a few hours later you indulge in unprotected uh, intercourse and then you expect that pill to work. So there is a proper medical procedure actually, or a guideline to follow with both PrEP and PEP. And I think, you know, because I got, you know, one of the messages that I had gotten after the read was, it was you talk about sex always being safe and intercourse being safe and consensual. And this can be, you know, safety can happen via condoms, it can happen via PrEP, it can ha happen via PEP. And there's so many ways to protect yourself during intercourse. And I remember getting a message saying, um, you know, you're, you're talking about safety so much, but there is, there are so many folks who do enjoy having unprotected sex. And my, and you know, the thing that I actually mentioned to that person as well was that that's fine, but it just should not come at the cost of safety. At the end of the day, you got to protect your own sexual health and your own sexual wellness, and you have the power to do it. And therefore, you do have things like PrEP, but read about it and actually consult a doctor before you start taking it. Know what kind of dosage is required, know when to take it, when not to take it, because that that's just benefiting you because you are basically ensuring and you're equipping yourself with the, with the right tools to protect yourself. And I actually feel that I think people who come around to take PrEP and PEP, I feel have you know, they are part of a community uh, where conversations are happening, the education, there might be like precautionary education and everything. And I would really encourage you that if, you know, you didn't know about this and you are in an environment that could be at risk or not safe or whatever, go read up, join, uh, you know, join an organization. There's so many resources online, educate yourself about it figure out a community that you can join that can help you with it. Um, it is not something for you to say, oh, I can just go ask the doctor about it. Uh, it is something that you really need to get educated about and then 
you know, um, it's it's a way of enjoying a sexual life or a relational life um, in a safe way, you know. But I think it takes a journey when till you reach there, you know. Um, so take that journey before you do it. Like I said, you know, we, we did the reel, but instead of people following, it was more about derailing the conversation. And I think that comes from, I mean, it was just such a deliberate attempt to make sure that nobody got the help. It just, you you wonder what kind of fear that comes from. But uh, very quickly, I want to actually come to some of the questions that came up on the reel. I think the first one has been answered, but I'm going to say it out anyway, because I find people connect to words that they have asked um, yeah. and it sometimes makes it better too. So the first one says, um, once you've been diagnosed with HIV, does that mean that the person can never have sex again? And um, does the partner's se sex life at that point end there or does taking medicines help? And we've had both of you telling us at great yeah. length that um, sex life doesn't end over there. And yes, medicines can help. Unfortunately, there's so much fear and ignorance around this, and also sometimes a deliberate desire to not find out that people kind of back off from relationships if they find that somebody has HIV. And a lot of times it is two people who have HIV who end up perhaps being together simply because that community is more open to understanding and acknowledging things. Yeah, no, I'm, you, that's, you know, I remember we had this chat and I think even with this person's question, you know, it just signifies that that fear of actually finding a companion or finding a partner or being able to have an active and healthy um, sex life after after being diagnosed, that question, the very question of it is is just, it's, it's basically telling of the kind of fear that exists, right? But, you know, like we already discussed, there is, there is, of course, the U equals to U stage, which is undetectable, is untransmittable, which happens when you're taking your ART medications regularly. And then there is also PrEP and PEP. So you're actually, if you imagine um, both partners in the situation, hypothetically, if one partner does have HIV and is on ART, is at a U equals to U status. And if they still want peace of mind, the other partner can also, with the help of a doctor and proper consultation, get on prep you know and that is if of course they really want peace of mind but you know you're there's so much there's so much out there for you to sort of safeguard yourself and your partner's sexual health so definitely the ability to have an active sex life um exists and it exists you know through all of these these methods the the bit that we were talking about was it's good that people know this because if you don't know this, you're going to always sit in that box or in that space of, I will never be able to be sexually intimate with someone who has HIV because that fear of contraction is so strong. And it is, like like, like Anvita said, stemming from the fact that, you know, we're still living in the mindset of the 80s, but the medicine has progressed so much, but we're still living with that, that fear and the, you know, the misconception stigma that existed back then. So... Yeah, a lot of people with HIV do end up, you know, being with people who also are HIV positive just because there is a level of empathy and understanding that exists. And you don't have to explain yourself. You don't have to explain medication and treatment and all of that stuff. So, it, you know, it just it becomes easier. And that shouldn't be the case. Not to say that they not, might not be great partners for each other, but sometimes, you know, you shouldn't have to be with someone just because they're, they understand this part of your who you are and this part of your diagnosis, but they might have a lot of other red flags. So, you know, it's an interesting piece. And I think it's more important that people become aware that yes, intercourse is very much possible. And, you know, and so I, I something that's coming up in my head and we don't need to, I, I think it's a different podcast, like and there's another podcast. I think there is now a whole conversation around ethics and morality of disclosing if you're HIV positive, because you might not be a Trump, you know, you can't transfer if you are the, um, what uh, Zubair is talking about, that you cannot actually gift HIV to someone if you're at that stage. Um, then the question of 
should you or shouldn't you disclose is actually a personal choice, which, you know, like I'm saying, we can really have a whole podcast on it yeah. because there's so many layers on like whose choice is it and what is it. And, um, but that is a big discussion now around uh, ethically, morally, do you or do you not need to disclose um, any yeah. longer? So. No, that's okay, a very interesting one. It's something that I also deal with on a daily basis, but I think that's a whole different conversation. <laughs> and so just to leave it there that, People might think, and I am a pro promote, proponent of honesty and open communication, but in this case, it is the choice of the person with HIV. It, it is like coming out and it's their choice. Yes. Um, so, and, you know, we can obviously discuss it in another podcast. Uh, but I just to call it my, my second coming out. It was like a second coming out for me. And the thing that I'm just going to, one last bit and the thing that I like you said it is your choice and it is also that you know you don't need to tell everybody you tell the people who you you value and possibly might even explore an intimate relationship with after you know whenever you feel ready it does not mean that oh you go on a first date and you tell somebody so it, it just depends and it is your personal choice it is your uh, your piece of information to tell or not to tell as long as you're doing it with good conscience and not putting someone at risk. Unless you're doing a podcast with Seema Anand and she has well, like... Then, um... <laughs> In which case you have to tell the whole world. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Next question that came up and again, a brief answer to this. What are the initial symptoms of HIV? What distinguishes them from normal STIs? So actually, this is an interesting one, and I'll actually try and keep it as specific to the question, is that with HIV, once you contract the virus, the first exposure, post-exposure to HIV, it actually can take um, up to about six to eight weeks to actually show up in a report, in a blood report, usually between like a month, month and a half to about two months, depending on how your body and your immunity Um but what happens at that point is called the zero conversion period of when the virus will start to show up. And initially you might not see any symptoms, but if at all you have very viral-like symptoms, when you get the regular viral, which is accompanied with a fever, body pain, a cold, um, that process could be the process of zero conversion if there is definite exposure to the virus or possible definite exposure to the virus. And that is the, the only sort of symptoms that you can sort of uh, attribute to HIV. And at that point, it's very important to get tested. And therefore, it is important in general, if you're sexually active and having unprotected sex, to test for HIV and all the other STIs that you should be testing for. But from a symptom standpoint, during seroconversion, you will find symptoms that are similar to a regular viral, your body pain, a sore throat, a cough, a cold, usually when you go for checkups, you will see whether your lymph nodes are swollen. So that's another tell, et cetera, to see, you know, whether you're at that stage of it showing up in a test or it's still you not know, yet zero conversion in your body. Uh, point out for everybody exactly where the lymph node would be. I was trying so to do that. And yeah, so the lymph node is basically here. And if it's a little swollen, a doctor will actually check all across here and, but mostly your lymph nodes are here. So he will check this out. And if it is swollen, then you will, you know, that's a, another tell to see the stage of with the viruses sort of in your body. And then of course, itchy throats, body pain, soreness, cold. Um, yeah, the regular virus. So that pretty much too. like a virus. Okay. Yes. Um, next one. Once diagnosed, and I know that you responded to this, so again, maybe just a quick response once again. Once diagnosed with HIV, how does it affect mortality? Do people die with HIV even after taking medication regularly? People do not die after being uh, diagnosed with HIV. Uh, HIV is not AIDS. HIV very rarely leads to AIDS today because you have the power of medication that keeps HIV at a very, very low limit in your body. You reach an undetectable and untransmittable st stage, which means you can live a very long, very healthy, very enriched life, even despite being HIV positive. 
Uh, next one, what are some other diseases that an HIV positive patient can catch? Are the HIV drugs effective enough to mitigate the chances of other ancillary fatal diseases? So HIV drugs will basically only control the amount of virus in your body and keep it at a very low minimal level. They're not drugs meant to treat any other, um, any other viruses or diseases or illnesses that you may catch. But the, the interesting thing about, about HIV medication is that if the virus isn't controlled, your immunity grows. You're keeping your immune system high. So it's just a, a, a question of how strong your immunity is. And if you're controlling the HIV and you're taking good physical care of yourself in general, HIV has no bearing on what you may or may not catch if you're on medication. You have to stay on medication. And initially, when you just get on medication, the chances of getting TB are there because the virus has not actually been medicated. It's in your body. So that is the only time where they might give you medication to, to prevent the chance of getting TB, but which rarely happens also because you're taking the ART medication that keeps your viral load low. So they're, they're actually not really related in that sense to you know put it short and to answer the question shortly. They're not related. You just need to make sure that you're on medication and you're taking good care of yourself like anyone would do. So I just want to add two things to what you were saying. One, I have a feeling this is coming from the confusion between HIV and AIDS. When yeah. you're on, when the HIV virus is converted to AIDS, your immunity and is your immunocompromised. At that point, you are more susceptible to catch as many like infections and illnesses. And that's why most people die of the, when they have AIDS, used to die of the infections and other like pneumonia and other things that they might catch. But we have to remember this is HIV, this is not AIDS. So your immunity is actually not compromised in the same way. ART is helping keeping the viral loads low, but that doesn't mean that you're superhuman. You will get whatever any other normal person yeah. gets. So you'll you get will, a cold, you'll get the flu, you'll get all of it. You will get the COVID, you'll get the malaria, you get you know, you will you are like any other person. So just because you're on ART doesn't mean you're not gonna get other illnesses. Uh, so I just thought, you know, it's important to say yeah. those two things. No, that's a really good point. Thank you both. And uh, finally, uh, well, actually, no, there are two questions. One is, what is the time period that you should, like, should you test um, at every point that you've had unprotected sex? How often do you need to test? And this particular question kind of confused me. They said, how long is should one wait before having unprotected sex a second time? Um, well, okay. Um, so we we'll, we'll kind of split them because I think they're two different things this person is trying to know. When it comes to testing, if you're sexually active, you ought to test every six months minimally. Uh, if you're having a very sexually active life, um, when it comes to HIV specifically, in case you feel like there has been exposure, you do a test, wait about four weeks and do a test because it won't show up before four to six weeks. Watch out for what I talked about in zero conversion. You can play this back. Um, but when it comes to the second part of the question, which is basically how long before you can have unprotected sex again, if consensually you're having unprotected sex with a partner, et cetera, after post disclosing your, um, your status, and you could do it when you're on medication and when you reached a U equals to U status, but you'll also be very important to protect both your sexual health and your partner's sexual health. So therefore, ensure that your partner is aware that you do have HIV, that you are HIV positive if you're going to have unprotected sex and ensure that either he's on PrEP, you're on U equals to you. That's the status that you're at. So it depends on and how long it takes you to get to U equals to Q. Or alternatively, if your partner <laughs> is but you have to have this conversation. There's not a one size fits all answer to this. And I would say that it's a really, you know, there are whatever, <laughs> however aware or educated somebody might be, 
the emotional reaction or the emotional fears uh, are always within us. Um, so, you know, have those conversations. Those conversations might be difficult conversations. It might take some time for you to get comfortable. Don't judge yourself if there are emotional fears uh, because, you know, we've all heard the 30-year-old stories. So it is really normal to be fearful. And, you know, it'll, and if you talk about it and get the help, uh, then you can overcome some of those fears and challenges. But it is normal. So don't judge yourself for having those fears. Yeah, I think um, this is something that it's quite important to put out. It's something that we have talked about, that if you feel that your partner has HIV, it is very normal to be afraid because educating yourself on it is not going to be an overnight thing. You are going to take time till you understand it properly. It is going to take time for you to get it. And so like Anvita said, don't judge yourself for that. Um, be afraid, be to kind to figure yourself. out this thing and then be kind to yourself and understand that it is okay to feel that way and to move forward from that fear rather than being mired, being stuck in that fear. Sorry, I think you might find that the setting has changed a little bit, but that's because we had a tech hitch. Uh, but we're, we're back. Um, one very strange question that came in for both of you, which I really didn't understand. So I hope that you can explain it to me. It's a lady who says that her husband has been cheating on her. She didn't realize that he was. He's been cheating on her with a lot of other women. And what's happened is that she has caught HIV from having sex with him, but he hasn't got HIV. And she said that the doctor said maybe it's because she was um, not feeling as strong. Maybe she was a little bit more susceptible and that's why she's got it. So is it something that you can do? Like, can you be a carrier for HIV and then get, get this? Uh, no, you can't. It's actually a very, it's odd. Even I find it quite confusing because if someone has contracted HIV, um, then they cannot necessarily be a carrier but not have it themselves. They have contracted the virus. That means you do have that virus and you can't just carry it and it can't stay, you know, dormant. And if it does, you would have not given it to your partner. So it, it's, it's actually a little confusing and I don't think we have all the information or maybe this person needs to get a little more information or consult another doctor but the but the the base matter is that if the husband got it through his infidelity and she got it through him which is highly unlikely given that then he definitely does have the virus because there's no way that she could have contracted hiv from her husband and him not have the virus so that does not make sense to me uh, but maybe we don't have all the information and maybe she contracted it from somewhere else. I'm not sure. I don't know. How do you, uh, and with that, over to you. As in, uh, you know, so one of the things that I will put out there is that very, because a lot of times it was seen as the gay man's infection, there was a community of women that were not paid attention to. And we know that majority of heterosexual women and actually in London, the, uh, the number of people who are increasingly getting it, because I think there's a lot of education in the gay community. Uh, yeah. Few people are contracting it. Fewer people are contracting it. It actually tends to be on the rise in the uh, people of color, like the Asian and the African um, uh, heterosexual women community. And it's mostly from this idea that there are a lot of heterosexual men who might be eng engaging in leisure sex with the same sex you know like with men or with other women and but the women think they're in a monogamous relationship so they don't really think about getting tested or you know checking or otherwise and it lands out that they have HIV so what I want to say is that this is a very common scenario but what seems peculiar about this one is that he doesn't have it so maybe it didn't show up on his test and it will later or she might have contracted it through other ways like blood or otherwise um, and it just so happens that the infidelity has come out now because of what happened you know and uh, that's come out because of the HIV results uh, and it might not have come out otherwise 
but I but I agree with the way we need more information. So I think it'll be hard to say anything conclusive because it just seems like a tricky uh, question. But basically, the baseline is that uh, some you cannot be a carrier without being infected. Is that what we're saying? Yeah, I mean, the, the whole idea of carrier is odd, right? Because it's, if you, if, you know, logically, if you have the virus and, and you're, you know, you're not taking medication and you have HIV and you have unprotected sex with someone else, and if, if she's gotten from him, that means he definitely has the virus if he's not seeking treatment for it. And if he is seeking treatment for it, then he's probably at a stage where the viral levels are lower um, and therefore the chances of transmission are lower. So it's 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 a little odd. And like I said, I think it needs more information because it's quite peculiar. Okay, so, sounds good. Um, I, I know that... Um... This is a conversation, like Anvita said, uh, Zubair, that we need to maybe have more of. This is not going to be the last one that we do. We need to have another one on this with um, a lot more questions and concerns. But for today, I would like to say thank you so much for joining us. Thank you more than that for being brave enough to face the entire world with this, um, with this openness because it's not easy. And you open yourself up to a lot of judgment and you're very brave and we love you for it. And you know you have our support always. Um, for everybody out there, if you need to get in touch with Zubair about any more questions or concerns, he can be reached on his Instagram handle, which is Zubair Kalsia. And of course, we'll have all the information in the caption below. So even if you don't know how he spells his name, you'll find it written down over there. And you will be able to reach out to him. Zubair is very, very supportive to everybody who does reach out. Um, if you have any questions um, on, consult on consultations, of course, you can always reach out to Dr. Anvita Madan Behel. And Anvita is on. Anvita Madan Behel at gmail.com. But once again, the information is at the bottom. And I am on info.seema.anand at gmail.com in case you want to send in any further questions. If you've uh, found the podcast helpful, if you've enjoyed it, please do comment, like, subscribe. And as always, till we meet again, stay safe and look after yourselves.